Hello, sports fans, and welcome to Let Me Speak, the show that shares sports' biggest headlines explained, uninterrupted, and maybe a little audacious. I'm Joe Braverman, and today's topics we'll be discussing are Who has the advantage after four games into the Stanley Cup Final? Plus, new developments regarding the PGA and Live Golf Battle. And what to expect from tonight's NBA Draft. It's episode 77 of Let Me Speak, and it starts right now. Hello, everybody. Once again, we are back in our usual time frame of Thursday, June 23rd, 2022 for the 77th edition of Let Me Speak. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in wherever you are getting this podcast. We had a Friday episode, but now we're back in our usual time frame. Obviously, not as crazy in terms of the, uh, the sporting world and also the schedule at least on my end, has been relatively calm and relaxed. So we are able to come back into our time frame of Thursday, releasing on a Friday. And honestly, I thought I'd be sweating my butt off right now, but it is actually cold, I would say. I was debating before starting recording, do I throw the sweatshirt on? Because that is what it's like here on the North Shore of Massachusetts. I mean, it's going to get warmer eventually, but the fact that it's been like mid-60s, low 60s in June of all things is it it blows my mind blows my mind absolutely but it is a nice day uh the sun has been out for the past couple of days was able to hit a few golf balls at the driving range still haven't gotten to go play around I'm really hoping to do that uh soon hopefully the work schedule will allow that for me but while I'm not playing golf I'm watching some hockey and I'm watching the Stanley Cup final and it has been You know, there have been a lot of blowouts, but I would still call this a fairly entertaining series, especially with the game a few nights ago, heading to overtime in Tampa game four, uh, the Avalanche able to win that one in overtime. And it was really exciting uh, watching the end in real time because Nazem Kadri literally comes out of nowhere from the middle, skates to the outside, fires it in and it takes a few seconds for everyone to realize like wait where's the puck where's the puck and it turns out that it just got like tucked into the into the post you know within the net uh but it counted as a goal and the avalanche are now one win away from their first stanley cup in about 20 years or so now i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna blast my own horn because i did say that um you know Colorado would win in five. I think they would win in five. And so far, that prediction's looking really, really good. You know, maybe they can close it out on Friday when they head back home. And I I would favor them. You know, I think regardless of even if they lose that game, they're in the driver's seat right now. I mean, obviously, when anyone has a 3-1 lead, it's advantage uh, Colorado. But this is one of the rare times where I'm not going to count out the lightning just yet. Because, I mean, you don't just become two-time defending Stanley Cup champs for a reason, possibly on the cusp for a third. And it's not like they've had deficits like this before. I mean, they have that championship mentality, but there are a few things that I see on the ice that really Tampa has to to fix. And some of it you you can't fix because Colorado is just a really good team out there. Uh, The first thing, obviously, is the special teams. I mean, penalties are killing the lightning right now. I mean, on the power play themselves, they're only one of 13 so far in the Stanley Cup final. Keep that in mind, one of 13 in the Stanley Cup. You do the math, that's not even 8% of a success rate. And meanwhile, on the other side, the Avalanche are six of 13, nearly 50% on the power play. So that's the most important thing right now for the Lightning. And it's tricky to, you know, pinpoint that one specific thing 
because when you look at game three, they dominated. It was 6-2 victory, and even though they were down one nothing, they used a really strong second period to kind of blow the doors open on the thing. And then all of a sudden, it's a quick turnaround where you're going to overtime. So I think it's just in-game adjustments for John Cooper. You know, I wouldn't worry too much about um, that game-winning goal. You know, when you look at his press conference, you know, he was miffed that there wasn't a too many men on the ice kind of call and that the goal counted, and then he left. Um, so I think Cooper should stop worrying about that and just start worrying about uh, his own team. And Andre Vasilevsky right now, he's under the mic- microscope right now because this is sort of where um, in, in series past, you know, going back to when the Lightning had this run, is where he would really start to uh, pick up, you know, the really strong play when it gets to later on in the series, game five, game six, game seven where he really starts to play shut down uh, hockey as a goaltender. Now, granted, he did give up the game winner, but the fact that he did hold a high-scoring team like Colorado to only three goals uh, in about, just doing the math, like 80 minutes of hockey, you know, 70 to 80 minutes of hockey, is still very, very impressive. And in that victory in game three, he gave uh, he only gave up two goals. So, you know, a lot of it is just night and day. Um, but I think Vasilevsky, if he doesn't have a good game, then Tampa does not win. Absolutely not. And I think, you know, two is probably the relative benchmark for uh, Vasilevsky to give up because I think the Lightning do have their scoring options uh, with Stamkos and uh, Kutra. Granted, he didn't play. Uh, but I do think Tampa, you know, they're not totally out of the water just yet, but it's going to come down to how well. Vasilevsky uh, plays in the net. And it's not like he's getting any kind of break at all. I mean, so far in these four games, Colorado has gotten at least 30 shots on net. So he's had to work. But I also look at the face-offs for the Lightning. You know, when you look at the close games that there were, I'm talking game one, game three, and game five, the Lightning had the advantage in face-offs 36-24, 43-31, and kept it even uh, in game four at 35 apiece. So dominate. I'm not saying, you know, dominate the faceoffs, but don't don't let Colorado get the big advantage in that because this is a very dynamic scoring team in the avalanche that can, you know, score from anywhere and anyone. So the faceoffs are going to be absolutely huge, especially in their own end because the Lightning aren't going to get as many scoring chances as the Avalanche just because they are so quick and they're so fast on the ice that Tampa has a really hard time and it seems like they're always playing catch-up. Um, so I think those are the keys uh, for the Lightning to stay in this series is Vasilevsky having a good night and winning the face-off battle overall over the 60 minutes. So I think that's absolutely huge. Colorado, on the other hand, I think the big advantage, as I mentioned, was speed. And I think, you know, this is a team that made the adjustment from game three to game four, and they've learned to sustain that sort of speed for 60 minutes. And not only that, but when you get a dynamic player like Nazem Kadre, I think that is a huge difference maker. Absolutely huge, because you were already putting up seven goals with McKinnon uh, and Makar and all these guys. Now you add another piece in Kadri. That's another guy to take an account uh, for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Just another dynamic weapon that they have. Um, but I'm very impressed with how they've been able to lock down uh, defensively on Tampa. You know, Tampa is a very high scoring uh, team, not as high scoring as them in the Avalanche, but the way they've been able to sh- sort of uh, shut down the Lightning and really just make them play from behind that's been absolutely huge is that when uh it, basically Colorado needs to have a big lead in that first period and they've done a really good job of uh shutting down the lightning in terms of basically giving them no answers in the first period at all you look at they're just skating all up and down the ice like it doesn't even bother them at all and you see them getting out to three one leads three two leads um you know, playing from ahead is uh, huge 
for this avalanche team. Now, granted, they were down two to one. They got that third period goal to send it into overtime. But still, even having that little bit of margin is huge for uh, the avalanche. If you're giving them a, a whiff that they are still in the game and that they could still come back and win, then you're absolutely done. So the Lightning have to find a way to get uh, multiple goals uh, for a lead. I'm talking two, three, four. You got to get it to that. And you want to get the lead after the first period. You know, we're, we're learning that whoever's got the lead um, after the first period, or even if it's tied, you know, there's still, it could go either way. Um, so, I mean, the overarching question is, do I think the Avalanche are going to finish it off uh, on Friday? I'm going to say yes. I think they find a way to win the Stanley Cup uh, tomorrow night just because it, it's hard for me to picture Tampa winning on Colorado's home ice where they've been so dominant, not just in the playoffs, but all season long. I mean, I think they've only, uh, the Avalanche have only lost three games in all this postseason. So it's been a very dominant run. I think they've only lost one game so far at home during this Stanley Cup playoffs. So it's hard for me to picture the avalanche, especially with the crowd uh, as rowdy as it is. I mean, you look at their sort of watch parties back in Denver, you know, those are just as crazy outside the arena. You bring all that energy inside the arena. Now, granted, the lightning have been through everything over the last three years, um, but this is just, this is a different animal. And I think the, I think the avalanche find a way uh, to win that Stanley cup. And I think it's going to be a, I, I have a feeling it's going to be a very, very close game. It's probably going to come down to that third period. Um, whoever gets that first goal uh, in the third period, I think it's going to set uh, a big standard. It wouldn't surprise me if Tampa came out and knocked off Colorado and sent this to a game six or even to a game seven, but I still am liking my prediction with Colorado winning, and I'm liking it even more that it might happen in five games. I mean, I haven't been, I haven't been totally perfect on my predictions in this podcast over the past uh, year and a half that I've had it. Um, but hey, if this is a prediction that I can get right, I'm going to hang my hat on it. So game five, Friday night in Denver, will the Stanley Cup be awarded to the Colorado Avalanche? That is something that hockey fans are going to have to wait and see. Shifting gears to the world of golf, we've had little tiny segments during quick hits, but I really want to dive in deep into this because again, we're getting more and more drama as the weeks go on and the live tour starts to get more players. But before the feud, let's talk about that U S open in Brookline, man, what an entertaining final round. Uh, that last group with Matthew Fitzpatrick and Will Zalatoris. I mean, talk about some clutch, clutch play. I mean, the course uh, at the country club was giving everyone fits. I mean, the winning score was six under, you don't normally see that in a, some tournaments. I mean, the greens were all over the place. Uh, the weather being a factor, being a little cool and windy, uh, it, big factors. But it was that bunker shot on 18 by Matt Fitzpatrick. I mean, a fairway bunker is very hard uh, to play out of for anyone who's played golf. And what this guy did, what Fitzpatrick did, was absolutely smoke the thing out of the bunker, get it on the backside of the green, backside of the green and set himself up for a two putt to keep him at that six under. And then Will Zalatoris right at the end, he had the birdie to win it, but again, it was the greens were all over the place. So, I mean, it's again, another opportunity in a tournament that Zalatoris falls short on, but you know, I, I sort of compare it to uh, the Boston Celtics in that, this is a young guy who's getting used to the big time stage. And the more times that he's on this stage, the more he'll learn from it. So I think Zalatoris is going to get his win sooner rather than later. And I think 
you know, I would put my money on him for uh, the Open Championship next month uh, at St. Andrews. I'd put my money on Zalatoris to finally break through. And if he doesn't do it this year, he's definitely going to do it uh, next year. But, hey, credit to Matthew Fitzpatrick for not only winning uh, at the Country Club as an amateur in 2013, but winning the U.S. Open at this very same course uh, this year and getting his first ever major win. So props to that from the U.S. Open. But, of course, you can't talk about golf with talking about the PGA versus the Lyft Tour. That feud has been going on, and we've got some more names uh, getting added to the mix. Brooks Kepka and Abraham Answer both ranking in the top 50, the latest names to leave the PGA Tour and go take that money with the Saudi back tour. And for Brooks Kepka, I mean, looking at him during, you know, open week during the U S open, he was very passive and defensive during the press conferences. If you look back on it, he was saying, listen, let's stop talking about this sort of thing. Let's just get to uh, the U S open. Let's get to playing golf actually. So he was very, he was very defensive on anything like that. And there were also rumors that, you know, he was going to join eventually, um, so I, I did sort of see this coming. I mean, it, it's still kind of sad because, you know, now Kepka and DeChambeau can take their on course feud from the PGA to the live tour. Um, and you know, I, I've been very, I, I haven't said exactly what I think about golfers leaving the PGA for the live tour. And that's just been, you know, the media has just been blowing this thing out of proportion, you know, basically saying, oh, these golfers uh, are backing terrorists and stuff like that for taking all this money and joining the live tour. No, I'm, I'm not going that route. I mean, do, do I like that they leave the PGA tour for the live tour? No, but I get it. I get why they're leaving. Everyone's got their own, you know, personal opinions, you know, for Dustin Johnson, he's talking about what's best for his family. Sergio just hates everyone in the PGA. Um, so, I mean, if, if, if they're being offered this kind of money, it, it, it'd be really hard to turn down, you know, and, to and to tell golfers, you know, to tell PGA golf pros, you know, look at the moral high ground rather than the giant amounts of money that are being offered it is really hard, is really hard to turn down. So, I mean, I get it. I don't like it, but I'm going to respect the decision that these golfers do take. Um, but someone who does not respect those decisions is the PGA commissioner, Jay Monahan. Um, and he's just gone a step further to build more and more of this drama. I mean, first off he's um, he's made changes to the PGA tour. He's increasing the purchases or the purses, excuse me, of uh, some events like the players tournament, the Memorial, uh, the Arnold Palmer, invitational he's gone back to uh the regular fedex cup uh being in a calendar year from january to august i believe is uh what i saw um so he's got he's he's basically doing you know probably what he should have done you know years ago because you know some reasons for people or for golfers leaving for the live tour was how the pga treats its players you know the players want to be treated sort of as like, you know, independent and sort of stuff like that. And uh, the PGA hasn't been, you know, they have all this kind of wealth and they haven't been able to uh, throw it out there. But now that there's a little bit of competition, he's able, uh, Moynihan that is, he's going to go to what the players like. And he's going to try and please, try and please everyone who's on the PGA right now to say, listen, this is what we can do to try and make you stay. You know, so because we have money too, we can make the game uh, entertaining as well. Um, but I mean, the comments from earlier this week, I mean, he is like, he's going to turn this thing into an all out war. I mean, a couple of quotes that he said was that the Saudi League was trying to buy the game of golf and that they're an irrational threat. You know, the, the way I sort of look at it is that when you're, sort of a high you know if you're like a big time company not not just saying pga but like if you're a if you're a national or like a worldwide company like you know just not going on sports but it's like if you're a if you're a mcdonald's or you're, or you're an amazon something that's used globally 
you know, you don't acknowledge the competition, you know, that that's just taking the moral high ground in terms of not giving in to any kind of outside noise or outside threats that are possibly out there. That's how you sort of, I guess, win the battle. Because, I mean, let's face it, the, the Saudi League has been in development, you know, it's only been around for a handful of months. You know, you got to get into a few years uh, before you start to actually see the impact that's going on. Um, so, you know, what I see with Monahan is that he tried that sort of strategy of just disregarding the Saudi tour saying, oh, it's nothing. You know, we like a little competition, you know, playing it off. But then when they're taking guys like Dustin Johnson, a big name like Phil Mickelson, uh, DeChambeau, Kepka, answer those guys now he's got to start to acknowledge it and he's got to bring it to the forefront because he's getting bombarded saying like hey what about the live tour what about this what about that what about that and he's had to come up and say listen this is what we're going to do we are going to do this to try and fight off the saudi tour um so that's sort of what i'm seeing uh with this sort of battle that's going on and i think you know this isn't something that's going to be solved overnight it's not like the saudi league is going to totally fold uh, tomorrow. And it's not like the PGA tour is going to lose all its players tomorrow. So this could be, you know, we could be right back here in 2023. We could be here on June 23rd, 2023, talking about the exact same thing. And they might even see more players take off, or they might have players from the Saudi tour leave there and go back to the PGA. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me at all, but this is definitely a development between the PGA tour and the Live Golf series that is going to be years in the making. While we have our big headlines, there is much more to talk about in the world of sports. So let's dive in once again to this week's edition of Quick Hits. And we start with tonight's NBA draft. I mean, we're less than a week removed from the NBA finals, and we're already talking about the draft. We'll have a uh, deep, we'll have a dive into uh, what takes place in the draft tonight. It'll already have uh, come and gone by the time this episode airs, but the top three looks like it's set in stone. You know, some are saying it's a deep class. I think there's more questions than answers about this draft. If you're asking me about the top three, I would say Orlando's best fit is probably Jabari Smith. I just think, you know, that's a better option than Jonathan Isaac and all the injury history that he's had going on. Then you got the Thunder and the Rockets. They both need a center. If you're asking me at the number two spot, I would say that Chet Holmgren is probably going to be the guy for Oklahoma City just because they need a center and they're kind of, you're, you're going on potential for Chet Holmgren because this is a guy, you know, you're hoping for a Giannis type development where he gets a little bit stronger and he sort of develops an inside game. We know that he can shoot and we know he's a, he, he was a double, double machine at Gonzaga. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll see what the Thunder do there. And then the Rockets, that probably leaves them with Paolo Boncaro. Not a totally bad option there at number three. I sort of compare it to 2019 when it was Zion, Ja, and RJ Barrett. Everyone was happy uh, with where they were in the top three. I am really curious about two teams that are lottery teams. That's the uh, Portland and New York. I mean, I want to see what the Blazers do. Who else are they going to pair with Damian Lillard? Lillard because they already made the trade for Jeremy Grant to give him another offensive option. What are they going to do at number seven? Because you're doing all you can to try and appease your superstar player. And he, if he has said outwardly, I want to stay in Portland and you need to take advantage of that, which means get guys who can help you win now, win now. And then for the Knicks, I mean, we always know that they're going to be in the conversation for big name players who might possibly be free agents or trade options out there, but they still have the pick at number 11. So I want to see what they do with that kind of development. If they're really involved in any kind of, you know, superstar that might be out there on the trade market or possible draft day trades with that number 11 pick, but it should be a very entertaining NBA draft. 
And speaking of the Knicks and that superstar potential, there is options for Kyrie Irving because we still don't have word if he's going to opt into his contract with the Nets or if he's going to opt out. Just to point it out like this, if he opts in, he's going to be making $36.5 million. And if he opts out, he's got opportunity to possibly make more than that with another team. Just because the Nets are so hard capped right now uh, with Ben Simmons and with Kevin Durant, there's not a lot of options to try and build the team. So I think Brooklyn has seen the light and not really see a long-term future uh, with a guy this toxic, not just in the locker room. Um, you know, the options are out there, but I still, if you ask me, the odds are would probably be that he stays in Brooklyn. I think he is going to stay, maybe resign for like a two or three year kind of thing. Maybe not a five year max kind of thing. But I think management is going to have to remind Kyrie who's in charge. You know, no making this about yourself. No stupid comments to the media. No vaccine, you know, mandate. Try and make it all about you. That's all That's all the Nets have to do if they're going to bring back Kyrie Irving and go after a championship. <laughs> Sticking of the world of basketball, we turn to the women's game and talk about one of the greatest who's going to hang up the sneakers when the season is over, and that is Sue Bird. She announced that she's going to retire after her 21st season, and honestly... Arguments are that she could be on the women's basketball Mount Rushmore. I think she's for sure a top 10 women's basketball player of all time, just because the accomplishments are some of the best that a women's player has ever had. 21 seasons, all with the Seattle Storm, 13-time WNBA All-Star, including being named a captain for this season and being named a starter, four-time champ, five-time Olympic gold medalist, NCAA national champ, and the all-time assist leader in the WNBA. I mean, what a career for Sue Bird. And it's kind of been overlooked because she's had to play at the same time as like Diana Taurasi and Candace Parker and all these other great players. But Sue Bird should be saluted for an incredible career. And I expect to see her name into the basketball, not just women's basketball, but all of basketball. I, am, I want to see her name in the Hall of Fame. In the world of baseball, no one can stop talking about the New York Yankees, and it's really hard to say, but come on, they're 51 and 18 right now. They are by far the best team in baseball record-wise, and they've got their third best start in franchise history. Some numbers are even saying they're better than the 27 Yankees. And the 27 Yankees are regarded as some of the, or maybe the best team in MLB history. Now, I don't think the pace can be sustained. They're definitely not going to stay on this pace. You know, I think the pace is like they're going to have 130 wins or something like that. I'm not 100% sure. But, I mean, I think they're right where they think that they should be, especially with all the weapons that they have uh, in the lineup. I mean, come on. They picked up Matt Carpenter off the streets, and he's hitting 265 with six homers and 13 RBIs so far. I mean, you still have Stanton, Torres, Donaldson's been playing well. Isaiah, Isaiah Kiner Falefa has played well. Joey Gallo's hitting some home runs. But of course, the engine for the Yankees starts and ends with Aaron Judge. And so far, I think he's my early pick for AL MVP. I mean, so far, 27 homers, 52 RBIs. I mean, he is just clobbering the ball wherever he goes. Now, granted, the fence in right field at Yankee Stadium is basically like a little league fence. So, you know, part of it is that. But, I mean, he's hitting the ball at a torrential pace. And, you know, it's giving me flashbacks of 2017 when he probably should have had that MVP outside of Jose Altuve. Um, but, I mean, if the Yankees, if, if he's swinging a bat like this and he gets it into the postseason, the New York Yankees are going to be very hard to stop. <laughs> And lastly, sort of on a touchy sub back, su subject, excuse me, we go to uh, the Washington Commanders situation as now it's getting serious as we're hearing testimonies from the Oversight House or the House Oversight Committee. And Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL, was testifying yesterday about the workplace 
uh, and the allegations under their owner, Dan Snyder. And of course, the big story is that, you know, we've heard a lot of quotes saying like, um, he hasn't seen a workplace environment like that. He's already punished uh, the commander's organization and Snyder himself. And then he even said, I don't have the authority to remove Snyder when a Democratic uh, congresswoman was grilling him saying, will you remove him? Will you remove him? And for once, he actually said the truth. He doesn't have the authority. He doesn't have the authority to remove Snyder. It's the rest of the owners who have the authority. But now the development getting into next week is that Dan Snyder is now getting a subpoena because he's refused to testify. And now uh, the chair has said, this is how we're going to get some answers. We're going to subpoena Dan Snyder. And honestly, you know, we could talk about this for hours. You know, we could talk about this situation for hours. But my overarching uh, thought is that if this does not end with him selling the team or being removed, as an owner, I will be very, very surprised because this is this is this is a very serious allegations of a workplace environment and it being allowed uh, by Dan Snyder. So if all of this is true, which is sounding like it very much is, then I see no reason for Dan Snyder to continue to be the owner of the Washington Commanders. And that is a wrap up once again of Quick Hits. Now for all you Boston fans out there, it's your favorite segment, hopefully, of this podcast. It's our Let's Get Local segment of the week. And before we dive deep into what we're going to talk about with the Red Sox and the Celtics, I do want to make a few notes about some Patriots news. First off, the red jerseys are back, and I am so stinking excited. Those things are beautiful. Those are beautiful jerseys, and I can't wait to see them back on the field with this generation of Patriots players. The second thing also is the big news of the NFL this past week, and that is the retirement of Rob Gronkowski. He's done it for his second time at age 33, but I'm not buying in until we get about maybe two years. Basically, once Tom Brady retires, then I know for sure that Rob Gronkowski is not coming back because let's face it. I mean, the retirement seemed like kind of out of nowhere. He waited until basically the beginning of training camp to say, yeah, I, I'm going to retire now. Um, so, I mean, Tom Brady might give him a call if the Bucs aren't playing uh, extremely well in Tampa and might say, hey, Gronk, uh, we need you. Um, and he might sign on. You know, it's just it, he might be a manipulative kind of person where like he did with the Patriots, you know, retired in 19, uh, only to take, you know, a year and a half off and uh, go join Tom in Tampa. So, um you know, that'll be something to watch for if Gronk actually will remain retired. Um, but, I mean, the Patriots' memories are still out there. I mean, he he helped the team to two Super Bowls, you know, three technically, uh, but he was injured for about uh, half the season. But, I mean, in my opinion, he's the GOAT tight end. He, he's the best tight end out there. Uh, sorry for all you Tony Gonzalez fans out there, but um, his memories are more with the Patriots, and uh, he's had a lot of great memories. He's a fun character. And uh, for the time being, we'll just salute him on retirement. But, you know, I'm not ready to accept it yet until uh, we get to the end of the year and uh, basically until Tom Brady retires. Um, so <laughs> we'll just see what happens there. Uh, so salute to Gronk so far on a great career. But let's talk about what's going on on the field right now, and that is the Boston Red Sox. My goodness, they are on fire right now. I believe the numbers are that they are 18-4. and four in the month of June right now. I mean, unreal, unreal. Considering where this team was nine games under 500. They were, I think 10 and 19, 11 and 20, something like that. They were nine games under 500 and now they're 39 and 31 and in sole possession of the second wild card spot uh, in the American league. And right now they're chasing the blue Jays. They, they might be knocking on the door of the blue Jays to maybe get to second place in the AL East. Because 
I, I think, you know, I talked about the Yankees. I think they're, they're far and away. It's going to be really hard to catch them. I was talking with one of my producers at WEI uh, this morning and um, we were both kind of saying, you know, like, you know, maybe five or six games is realistic. You know, that's how close you could possibly get. I mean, maybe Aaron judge gets injured, has to spend some time in the IL and that's where you can make up your ground. Um, but, you know, realistically, the wild card is what you're looking for, um, for this team. You know, we keep saying it week after week. And I kind of, that's what I thought in um, preseason, you know, expectations for this team. You know, granted, I didn't expect them to get on the struggle bus for a good month of April out there. Uh, but they are back to 500 baseball. Uh, they've got a bunch of players who are contending right now for, all, for uh, making the all-star team. Uh, with Devers being the leading first baseman and uh, third baseman, I should say, in voting. Bogarts is up there. Martinez is up there. Um, but I think the motor of this run has been the starting pitching. I think that's been the sole reason why this team has um, been able to turn it around. I mean, still you have still a bunch of starters injury. Chris Sale is just starting his rehab start. Evaldi's still on the IL. Whitlock is still on the IL. And you got guys coming up from AAA like Josh Winkowski pitching well. Cutter Crawford, I know he got banged up uh, recently, I think, against St. Louis. Uh, but he has still uh, pitched well. But, I mean, Nick Pavetta, man. Nick Pavetta. This is a dude who started 0-4 in his first six starts, and now he's 7-1 in his last eight starts. And he's got an ERA in the month of June of 2. 2.00. I mean, this dude is dealing right now. And not only that, but the guy right after him, Michael Walker, is just doing the exact same thing. You know, granted, he's been sort of more consistent from the start of the year to now. Um, but my goodness, I mean, Pavetta and Waka are making their cases to make the all-star team as well. And I think if they continue to pitch the way they are and you get Nathan Evaldi, hopefully is not uh, limited. Garrett Whitlock hopefully uh, finds a way to improve. And then you get possibly Chris Sale back in the rotation, possibly James Paxton uh, in the rotation, possibly. This is a really good starting rotation. And I think Alex Cora is kind of going back to uh, over-liable. I should also mention Rich Hill out there. Rich Hill has been uh, good as well. So you have a bunch of starters out there. But – I think Alex Cora is kind of going back to that old school style of trying to ride his starters uh, as much as he can. You know, he's letting Nick Pavetta go seven innings. He, he's giving complete games out there to um, Michael Walker, I believe. He's letting him go uh, deep into games. And not only that, but when you also have the bullpen playing better uh, with uh, Jake Diekman pitching better, um, you still have Tanner Houck in the closer spot. Um, just to name a few names. Um, this pitching staff, again, is exceeding expectations. Now, granted, I'm not going to put all my eggs into the basket of the bullpen. Don't you worry about that. Um, but I think when you have the rotation as well as they are, you know, this is, you know, we, we see it in the, we see it in the postseason is that if you have good pitching, then you're going to go a long way. And we saw that um, they were able to do that uh, for most of the postseason run. And, um, you know, it's only going to get better because you've got guys who have the potential of what they once were coming back into the fold. So I think pitching, especially in the bullpen, though, is something to really watch for. If the rotation, you know, granted, I don't think they're going to continue to play shutdown. They're not going to have shutdown pitching in that starting rotation. But if the bullpen can continue to pitch well with Deakman and Schreiber, um, just to give a few names out there, then this is a team that can really make some noise when you get into postseason play. And not only that, but you're now getting versatility in the lineup to give you that run support. I mean, come on, let's talk about this lineup. I mean, we know what Bogarts can do. We know what Martinez can do. We know what Devers can do. But how about guys like Rob Ref Snyder and Jaron Duran making noise out there? I mean, I want to focus in on Jaron Duran because he is a completely different player from what we saw in his call up uh, last season. The dude is swinging the ball a lot better. He's being a lot more patient um, at the plate and he's using what brought him to the dance 
effectively, and that is his speed and his base running. I mean, when you look at ground balls, I mean, nine out of 10, they're going to have to be hurried up. And we saw it uh, the other night when he forced an error from Javi Baez. Um, And, you know, on simple ground balls, he can make it from second to home. So, again, I like sort of that old school mentality of winning baseball games. And I think that's what this team has been doing. And they're getting versatility in the lineup. They're, they're getting production from one through nine. We know the big hitters are there. And hopefully Trevor Story will be able to join that. But you got Verdugo starting to hit the ball better. Christian Vasquez is playing great. And uh, Rob Refsnyder, as I mentioned, hitting the home run over the monster. I mean, if you get this kind of versatility in the lineup, I think this can be a very dangerous team. But I'm not going to take the cheese just yet. I'm not going to buy in yet. I want to see how this team plays in the second half of the year. And they've also got a really tough stretch of games coming up. You got a three game. Well, you got a nine game road trip. First off, you start with three in Cleveland against the team that just took over the lead in the AL central. You've got uh, a very hot team in Toronto where you're already missing players due to vaccination status, which is a completely different story in itself. And then you got, uh, three in Chicago against the Cubs, which can still be a very dangerous team because it's interleague play. So you don't know a hundred percent about them. So I want to see when it gets to July, you know, once we hit the month of July, you know, you're going to be playing Toronto. You're going to be playing Tampa. You're going to be playing the Yankees. How do they play like that? Because we know what they're doing now. They're winning against teams that they should win against, you know, sweeping the Tigers, uh, sweeping the Mariners, winning against the athletics, That's what they should be doing. You know, the benefit is winning two out of three against the Cardinals and then winning the upcoming series against Cleveland and then against Toronto. But we'll see what happens with uh, the Red Sox when they go once again on another road trip. But, you know, luckily it can take uh, everyone else's minds off of last week's NBA finals, which fans are still reeling about the Celtics losing. And now the questions become, what do they do for the off season? How are they going to address this need? And we've heard uh, from Brad Stevens in uh, his press conference that ownership gave him the quote unquote green light to do whatever he can to improve the team. So that means possibly paying it to luxury tax, getting some big names, you know, um, possibly making trades with some names that might be gone. I mean, the, the big debate is, you know, do you trade Marcus smart? I think, I think that is the, big question of this off season for the Celtics, because we know what the team needs. You know, we know that they need to get better on offense and they need scoring off the bench. We know, we know that for a fact. I said this last week, but I, I don't see any reason to get rid of Marcus smart because we see it all the time that a locker room is just as important as what happens on the floor. And I think with Marcus smart, you know, yes, he's a very streaky offensive player, But, I mean, unless Brad Stevens thinks that the defense will be fine without the reigning defensive player of the year, a guy in Marcus Smart that can defend all five positions and can give you that toughness, I don't see it. I just, I don't see it. Unless there's a better name out there on the market, you know, I don't see any reason to get rid of, of Marcus Smart. I'm I'm on one of those bandwagons. I just I I don't see it and I think the cost of getting rid of him is is more it, it's more risky than reward. So I don't see Marcus Smart. Let's just face it. He had a bad series. Everyone had a bad series. Let's not overreact to that, you know. If we're going off of that, then we should say Jason Tatum should be gone. And Um, Derek White should be gone and Grant Williams should be gone and Peyton Pritchard should be gone. You know, I would feel more comfortable with floating the idea of trading, you know, Grant Williams or Peyton Pritchard to get, you know, maybe a veteran uh, name off the bench uh, that can give you some offense. You know, I would float that out there. And I get that you want to float the idea of trading smart to see what you can get out there, but I don't see it. I just don't see, I don't see a reason to get rid of a guy who's basically the heart of your foundation and your foundation is defense because the defense was totally fine. I mean, unless you're telling me that Derek white or whoever you possibly bring in for a trade 
can play better defense or just as good defense as the defensive player of the year, then I don't, I, I can't see a reason to get rid of them. I don't, I don't see it. You know, I expect this team when we get to, you know, training camp, mini camp to run it back. They're going to have basically the same thing because this is still a team that's less than a year from hitting their stride. I mean, they didn't start playing well until the month of January. Okay. And it's only been about five months and they've had, you know, since that time, one bad stretch. And unfortunately it was at the worst time against a really good team. So when you get to a full year, a full 82 game season with this sort of core and this rotation, you know, let's see what they do with that. But overall, I say, hold on to Marcus smart and get some bench scoring. You know, we're hearing names that have opted out, like P.J. Tucker. Granted, he's not an offensive guy, but he's a veteran name out there. Nick Batum, who just opted out. Um, just thinking of names like that, you know, Brian Scalabrini on uh, Merloni Fourier Mego mentioned uh, Thaddeus Young or Yusuf Nurkic possibly out there. I think scoring bench is priority number one, and I think that's what Brad Stevens is going to address. And I think. He's not a he's not a dumb guy. He's a smart guy. He's he's gonna recognize that that this team needs offense and whatever way he can get it is is what he's gonna look for. But there's definitely a lot of storylines to look out for uh, in the city of Boston with the Pats bringing back their jerseys, the Celtics off season, and the Red Sox continuing to stay hot. There's gonna be nothing but headlines all summer long for all you Boston fans out there. to wrap up our show it's our lol moment of the week and before we get into that segment and the end of the episode i do want to congratulate uh team mep rocks from the ultimate boston fantasy draft uh they got the most amount of votes and they in your eyes the listeners minds and the fans minds had the best draft among all teams in our in our bonus episode of the ultimate boston fantasy draft if you haven't seen it head over to uh, our wherever you get this podcast and you'll find that bonus episode and you'll see how Team MEP Rucks constructed their team and had the best in terms of voting. But in terms of this week's LOL moment, we are going into a bunch of different moments, I will say. Not one particular moment, but a mom- moment. So this week's LOL moment of the week goes to The Golden State Warriors, they had their championship parade and there were definitely a lot of viral moments all over the place uh, during the parade in San Francisco. I mean, you started off with Draymond Green, who basically is only loved in uh, San Francisco and by Warriors fans who said F everybody else and started chanting that. Um, This is a dude who gets so into his own head um, and... I I still don't like him. Let's just be honest. I I don't like him at all. Um, But, you know, he's just a guy who gets into his own head. And, you know, you know, the the minute he sniffs success or anything like that, he starts playing well. He's going to start raining it on whether you like it or not. But I mean, you don't have to like it, but it was it was pretty entertaining the way he was acting. Um, So there was that. I mean, the star had to be Clay Thompson. I mean, he was all over the place. Uh, during the parade I mean uh, while he had the trophy and he was high-fiving fans he lost one of his other championship rings and he was like stop stop and all the fans were looking for it he was able to grab it and then he was running through the crowd and he actually knocked over a fan so he was just on cloud nine and honestly I'm gonna let him be on cloud nine considering what he went through I mean he was more at rock bottom than anyone else in that Warriors organization with the injuries missing two whole years I should say two and a half years. Um, He comes back. He looks great. And he was able to celebrate. So, I mean, I'll let Clay sort of bask in his glory, um, considering everything he's went through. And then you had Stephen Curry on uh, Instagram, basically on on the floor with the night-night caption. I mean, (laughs) 
I mean, you see, you see with all these parades, everyone's just on cloud nine. They're probably still drunk and stuff like that. You know, even, you even see guys like Steve Kerr's and Bob Myers, the GM who were still uh, having a great time out there. So, I mean, you, you have to sort of let the, you have to let the uh, players and the ownership and the fans sort of bask in that glory whenever it's parade day. You know, if they want to say whatever they want or not whatever they want, but, you know, if they want to, you know, bolster themselves, knock anyone else down. I mean, you know, give or take, you know, it really depends on it. But I'll sort of allow moments like that, you know, when you're still reeling off a championship, then I'd say it's okay to decide to kind of do these things. So, Golden State, Warriors fans, Warriors organization, and players for basically living on cloud nine after another championship and creating a bunch of viral moments for all of us to look back and laugh on. You have earned yourselves into this week's LOL Moment of the Week. So that wraps it up for this edition of Let Me Speak. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you're watching us on YouTube or listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, make sure, as always, you follow our pages on social media. That's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All you got to do is search Let Me Speak Podcast. And remember, as always, if you got a point, you got to get across. Just let the whole world know. Shut up and let me speak.